Mr. Motherfucking Baller on Mr. Baller Sunday. How y'all Sunday going? You know what I'm saying? We got Mr. Baller Sunday. We got top three, so that make it more better. Let's go ahead and get into it, because this video is 30 minutes long. You feel me? And, uh, no search key. <clears throat> Around 7.20 p.m. on the evening of December 11th, 2002, a police department in a rural English county called Surrey started receiving all these frantic emergency calls. Now, all of these calls were coming from drivers on a heavily trafficked highway called the A3, and they all were saying the same things. They had seen this totally reckless driver with super bright headlights that was weaving in and out of traffic and going at high speeds and nearly crashing into people, and that a couple of the callers said they actually saw this car go down the embankment off the side of the highway, and so it looked like they might have crashed. And so, of course, this police department, after getting all these calls, decided to send out a couple of officers to see what was going on. When the two officers got out to the A3 and began patrolling the area on the A3 where all these calls were saying they had seen this reckless driver, they didn't see the driver. They didn't see a wreck on the side of the road. They didn't see any signs of an accident. I mean, there was nothing there. Now, had only one person called in about this wild, reckless driver, at this point, the officers would have chalked this up to a mistake or even a prank. But so many people called in about this one particular reckless driver on the A3 that these two officers decided to just keep on looking and really see if they can figure out where this driver went. And so to this point, the two police officers had been just driving on the A3 to try to find this driver. And so they decided they would park their vehicle, get out, and walk on foot on the edge of the highway because there were these huge forests that lined either side of the A3. In fact, Surrey, the county in England where this was, was one of the most heavily forested areas in all of England. And so these forests on either side of the A3 I won't be around were very dense. You could not see very far into them. And so these officers were thinking that it might be possible that this driver, if they were driving as recklessly as all the callers made it seem like, they could have veered off the highway, gone down the embankment, and then because they were going at such a high speed, they could have crashed their way into one of these forests and basically disappeared from view from the road. That in order to see this crash in the forest, you'd have to be basically in the forest. And so these two officers, they pulled over, they got out, and they began walking along the edge of the highway, staring into the forest, looking for a sign of a car wreck. And sure enough, after walking for a while, one of the officers spotted something deep in the woods that looked almost metallic or plastic. Whatever it was, it wasn't supposed to be in the forest. And so the officers made their way into the tree line and began walking through all the trees. And as they got closer, they realized very clearly there was a car. There was a wreck in the forest. And so the two officers, they begin running towards the wreck, they're calling for backup on the radio, they get to this wreck in the middle of the forest, and they're on the driver's side, and they look inside the car, and there's no driver in the driver's seat, but they looked through the car to the passenger side, and they saw the front passenger door was wide open, and on the ground, on the other side of the car, was very clearly a body. And so the two police officers rushed around the car to get a better look at the body. And when they did, you know, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. It didn't make any sense. Like, what was this? Now, to understand why these police officers were so caught off guard by what they were seeing, we need to go back five months to July 16th, 2002. On that night, a 21-year-old man named Christopher Brian Chandler finished up his beer at a pub in West London. And for reference, where this pub was located was about one hour north of that stretch of the A3 highway in Sir Father located at that pub is a, is a bar where the car was found in the woods. This night, Christopher had gone to this pub with a close friend of his. This was meant to be a fun night out. But, you know, as Chris is finishing up this beer, he began to feel really antsy because it turned out Christopher was actually wanted by police in London for robbery. Damn. And so he hated staying in one place for too long. And so the only people who even knew where Christopher was was the friend he was with at the bar and then also Christopher sure thought about he knew he was at this particular pub. And so finally, Christopher got so anxious about being in this pub for too long that he told the friend he was with that he just wanted to leave. And so he said goodnight to his friend. The friend stayed at the pub and Christopher left, got in his car and began driving south. But Christopher never arrived at the place he was trying to go. He just sort of disappeared and nobody heard from him again. 
Christopher's brother eventually would report Christopher missing, but remember, the brother knows Christopher is wanted for robbery, and so Christopher suddenly going on the lam and just disappearing for a while was kind of par for the course, and so the brother really didn't think this was a big deal. And also, the police felt the same way because they know Christopher is trying to elude them, and so it makes sense he would be missing. Yeah. And so as a result, nobody really followed up on Christopher's missing person report. Everybody just kind of moved on. That is, until five months later, when all those drivers began calling into the police in Surrey mm -hmm. about seeing this totally reckless driver careening down the A3, who eventually crashed into a ditch, and then those two officers, they went out to that stretch of A3, and sure enough, it was Christopher's car, and the body on the ground was Christopher. However, there was a problem. When the two police officers walked up on Christopher's car and saw it for the first time, they were struck by how old it looked. But it didn't really register with them why that would matter. It just stood out to them that this is a really, really old and rusted up car. But when they went around to look at the body on the ground, Christopher's body, they saw that his body was actually mostly a skeleton, which meant Christopher did not crash and die on this night, December 11th, 2002. Very likely, he crashed and died five months earlier, right around the time he... So that was saying ghosts or something? What the fuck? disappeared. Now, the Surrey police, they say that this was all just one big coincidence, that the reckless driver that all these drivers were reporting that night on the A3 must have not crashed and actually just kind of got away, and then just by coincidence, when the police were searching that area of the A3 for the reckless driver, they happened upon Chris and his car. But remember, several of the drivers who called in that night about seeing this reckless driver on the A3, they specifically said they saw the car veer off the embankment and crash down below near the tree line. Like, this is a serious crash. Someone needs to get out here with an ambulance because probably someone's hurt. And then when the police got out and oh. searched the exact area where this crash supposedly uh, happened, that is crazy. they find Chris's car that had all the hallmarks of a car that was driving recklessly on the A3 that veered off and crashed into the woods. I mean, they found Chris and his car because of these calls, but it could not have been Chris. But what other car could it have been? As of today, we do not have a good explanation for how this happened, and so it's been dubbed the A3 Ghost Crash. I mean, that's kind of creepy if you ask me. Well, we finally did it. I don't know if it was all the acid we poured into their contact lens solution, or if it was all the wild predators we released in their house, but somehow, some way, we killed the like button. And I know this because the ghost of the like button paid me the blood merchant. Blood.com special resurrecting on B.A. Boudin. Damn. I feel so damn much the damn ad came off. I want to have it. In, and even though there was a massive age difference bar in a tiny village and table for two on the morning of august 2nd 2017 two men sat together laughing inside of a bar in a tiny village in northern france the men were named Lucien Perrault and Olivier Boudin, and even though there was a massive age difference between them, Lucien was 69 years old and Olivier was 38 years old, the two were totally inseparable, to the point where the people in the village referred to them as father and son. Lucien had spent his whole life working in manufacturing in a nearby city, but just four years earlier, he had finally retired and he had moved into a small home inside of this northern French oh. village. But when he had first moved in to this new home, he had been very lonely and sad. You know, Lucian was divorced, he struggled with alcohol, and he had had a really tough life and he just wasn't doing well. But when he met Olivier, his whole life turned around. When the two met, Olivier also was kind of like a down on his luck guy. He was struggling with some health issues that made it hard to work. And so for years, he had been bouncing between the nearby city and this village in northern France, looking for work somewhat unsuccessfully. And so when these two happened to connect, it's like they bonded over having kind of difficult lives. And for Lucien, what really mattered to him was Olivier, despite being so much younger than him, did not treat him, did not treat Lucien like he was this dried up, worthless old man. 
He treated Lucian like a peer. And so together, these two very unlikely best friends began kind of orchestrating their lives around the other. And before long, it was like their lives had all this new structure and routine and meaning to them, because again, the two men got to be together basically all day long. So on this particular morning, as Olivier and Lucien were together at this bar, they began talking about what they wanted to do that night. And they settled on having a barbecue at Lucien's house. Lucien would cook up some beef and they would sit out on his back garden patio and just spend the night together. It sounded like a wonderful plan. And in fact, the bartender would say that when Olivier and Lucien finally left the bar that day, that he recalled overhearing them being so excited about this particular barbecue. And so that evening, Olivier and Lucien arrived at Lucien's house and they went out to the back patio where Lucien had already draped a nice tablecloth over this small round table. It was a red and white checkered pattern tablecloth. And on this table was an open bottle of wine and some cheese and a baguette. And so Olivier, he sat down and began enjoying some wine and bread. And Lucien walked over to the grill and began cooking up the beef. Lucien had a neighbor. We're gonna call her Marie because we don't actually know her real name. And Marie's second floor window overlooked Lucian's garden patio where the two men were having this cookout. And so that night, Marie did glance out and saw the two men kind of listening to music and goofing around. And she was used to them spending lots of time together. And she was also used to them staying up late at night. And so she figured, you know, tonight's going to be another one of those nights where these guys are up late, having wine, celebrating, whatever. You know, she was just going to shut the window and try to ignore the noise coming in and just let them do their thing. And so eventually Marie would do that. She would go to bed to the sound of music coming from next door and the sound of men talking. And then the next morning when Marie got up around 6 a.m., she looked out that window again and frankly was not that shocked at what she saw. Lucian was still just sitting at the table looking like he could be eating some bread or still drinking wine. And Olivier had clearly passed out on the ground. Now, Marie didn't judge. She knew these two liked to stay up late and drink and do stuff like this. And so she thought, you know what? None of my business. Then at 9 a.m., so three. So them niggas just be laying down, laying down, in the, in the, in the, on the ground, randomly. I don't know. The hours after Marie had first woken up, she left her house to go to another neighbor's house to feed their chickens while they were away for the day. And as she passed by Lucian's house, she glanced into his back garden patio and she saw Lucian was still just sitting at the table and Olivier was still passed out on the ground. It was like they hadn't moved for three hours. But again, Marie's thinking, none of my business. And so she just kept on going, went to her neighbor's house and fed the chickens. Good neighbor. But when Marie <laughs> came back to her house three hours later around noon, she looked again into Lucian's backyard and she saw the two men still had not moved. Lucian is sitting at the table and Olivier is laying on the ground. And suddenly Marie's thinking, wait a minute, you know, the sun is high in the sky right now. These guys aren't moving. They're going to get heat stroke. You know, we got to do something about this. And so she yelled out to Olivier and Lucian, but she got no response. And so Marie just walked into Lucian's backyard. And as she got closer and closer to the two men, she realized that they were not moving at all. Like they were not breathing. They were Something dead. was horribly wrong here. And so Marie, she just turned and ran to another neighbor's house. She told them what was going on. And they got these big pots Duh. of water and they ran back and doused Olivier and Lucian with water, trying to get them to snap out of their drunken stupor. But the two men did not move at all. Motherfucker, you live for six hours and they still land in the same spot. Them, them people dead, man. Be free. All when the water hit them. Clearly, they were dead. The next day, the local prosecutor announced there was going to be an investigation into the two men's deaths, which were being classified as criminal acts. And the prosecutor also said that it seemed like Lucian and Olivier died at the same time, and so most likely this was either a double homicide or a murder-suicide, and the primary theory as to what killed the two men was poison put in their food. And so police sent off the canned beans the two men were eating to this institution in Paris to test it for something called botulism, which is a deadly toxin that will grow inside of canned foods, but it came back negative. And then also police sent off the rest of the food the two men were eating to various other laboratories to be tested for poisons. And again, all of it came back negative. There was nothing that the police could detect in any of the food they ate. And so police were kind of confused for a minute, the fuck? but then the autopsies came back for Olivier and Lucien and everything changed. Lucien and Olivier 
were not murdered. This was not a murder-suicide. They didn't die from botulism or from some poison in their food. They died because of a set of very particular circumstances. Both Lucian and Olivier suffered from non-fatal minor medical issues. Lucian had bad dental health and so was missing a couple of teeth, and Olivier was suffering from a heart condition called cardiomegaly, which means his heart was slightly enlarged and somewhat fragile. However, his condition was totally being monitored by doctors and was under control. But just for a second, on the night of August 2nd, 2017, when Lucian and Olivier were having that cookout in Lucian's backyard, their non-fatal minor medical issues suddenly became a really, really big deal. Lucian cooked up a big plate of beef rib. Now, beef rib can be difficult to chew, even when you have all your teeth and take your time. But Lucian was missing teeth, and he loved this beef rib so much, he was wolfing it down really quickly, and so he wasn't chewing it enough, and at some point, he swallowed a particularly big, unchewed bite, and he began to choke. And when that happened, his best buddy, Olivier, sitting across from him, he stood up to try to help his friend, who's basically dying right in front of him, and the stress of this moment caused his heart to seize up, his heart, which is already enlarged and had fragile, a heart attack. and he had a heart attack and died. And then Louis, who now has no one to help him, continued to sit at the table trying to get his beak out of his throat, but he couldn't, and he eventually asphyxiated and died as well, hunched over at the table. God damn. That's fucked up. That's some fucked up shit. So the 8sleep is a pod cover that fits on a mattress like a fitted sheet, but it's temperature controlled, so... I ain't no way. He choked. He choked, and then he had a heart attack already, because he already had a heart problem. That is fucking crazy to me. I ain't gonna lie. Nigga could have ate hamburgers or something. A little after 7 a.m. on the morning of April 15th, 2007, three men launched a 35-foot white catamaran called the Kaz-2 from a marina in oh. northeastern Australia, kicking off what was supposed to be the trip of a lifetime. The captain of the Kaz-2 was 56-year-old Des Batten, and for months he had been training for this trip. And the two friends that Des was bringing with him on this trip were Jim Tunstead, who was 63 years old, and Jim's brother, Peter Tunstead, who was 69 years old. All three of the men had spent a lot of time plotting their actual course they'd be going on, which was from this marina on the northeastern side of Australia, up and around the north side, and then down the western coast to Perth, which was their final destination, and where all three men lived. In total, this trip was supposed to take eight weeks, and all three Damn. men were absolutely giddy with excitement at the prospect of spending an entire two months basically just drinking beers and fishing. Now, Des, Jim, and Peter were not the types to blow off responsibility to go party. I mean, they were devoted family men. All of them had been married for 30 plus years. Des had two kids, Jim had four kids, and Peter had five kids. Damn. But they were all either retired or nearing retirement, and this trip was going to be kind of a way to celebrate the end of an era. And while all three of them had gone on other big sailing trips, this one easily was the biggest one in terms of the distance they were covering and how much prep went into it and how expensive it was. I mean, this was like 10x the scope got, and scale of true. any other sailing trip they had done. And so, on April 15th, 2007, shortly after the three men had launched their boat and kicked off this big trip, Peter. Hey, we were niggas on our own trucks, man. Hell no, nah, niggas slime you out, bro. Nigga kill your ass and throw your ass in the motherfucking ocean on some Tony Soprano shit. Wife would call him just to see how it was going. And she would say, you know, Peter was in the square and she could hear the other two men laughing in the background. And it sounded like they were about to start fishing and maybe have a couple of beers. And so it seemed very much to Peter's wife like this trip was going as well as it could be so far. And so eventually Peter told his wife that he had to go. He told her he loved her and then they hung up. Now, Des, who was the captain of the Kaz 2, was adamant about safety being the top concern for this trip. Even though all three men were relatively healthy and had a lot of sailing experience, and even though Des was a member of a volunteer marine rescue group and so literally could be called on to go perform rescues at sea, despite all this experience and know-how, 
before they kicked off this trip, Des made Jim and Peter go through all these man overboard drills on the Kaz-2 to make sure they knew how to do it if for some reason, you know, an emergency arose out at sea. And so the men got really comfortable using all the life-saving equipment and going over all the procedures. And then also when they charted their course, Des stressed that at no point should they be sailing into open water. They needed to stay close to shore the whole time just because it was safer. And so when Jim began filming a video around 10 a.m. on the day they set sail for this trip, you can clearly see the shore in the background of this video. Yeah, I can't be on no man. Hell no. Nah. Shit no. Nah. I ain't never been on no I have never been on no boat either. I don't need like I say, I don't play like that. Hell no. Nah. They're following the course they had planned. But a couple of hours after Jim had shot that video on nope. the day they left, a woman named Isabel Wheeler, who did not know Des, Jim, or Peter, and had never seen the cast 2 before, she was fishing in an area called Champagne Bay when she looked out into the water and she saw the cast 2 a white 35-foot catamaran sailing east to west across the horizon. And at some point, as Isabel was watching this boat, which really meant nothing to her, she just happened to be watching it, she saw it make a quick 90 degree turn and began sailing out towards the open ocean away from the coastline. Now, remember, Isabel knows nothing of this boat or its occupants and so has no idea that Des, Peter, and Jim had been so clear about at no point will we sail into the open ocean. It's too dangerous. Stay close to shore. She didn't know that. And so she just saw a ship turning and sailing out to the open water and she thought, okay, whatever. You know, so she didn't go and report what she saw. It was only later on when details emerged about what happened on the Cas 2 that she would later what come happened? forward and say, hey, I saw that boat and this is what they did. What the next day, April 16th, two more people would spot the Cas 2. These were two men who also did not know Des Peter Jim. They didn't want no hey, that, that, that's no grand theft auto. That boat was slower than a marble. Cas 2. They didn't know Isabel. In fact, these two men didn't know each other, oh, but independently... On I don't know if I mentioned this in my previous video. Speaking of Grand Theft Auto, Grand Theft Auto 6 is coming out, and yes, I'm reacting to the trailer when it come out Tuesday. Hey, I might... Hey, y'all might get a live reaction from it. I don't know. But, I'm reacting to it, and yeah, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm going out big, and I ain't gonna lie. I'm, I'm paying that $200. For that two hundred dollars, I'm paying two hundred dollars for that guy. I ain't gonna cap. This day, Personally, they looked out me. near Champagne Bay and they saw the Cas Two sailing east to west in the exact same spot that Isabel had seen it the day before. Now, remember, the Cas Two was traveling from that marina on the northeast side of Australia all the way around to Perth. It was a point A to point B trip. There was no reason the Cas 2 would ever double back and be in the same place 24 hours later, but here we were 24 hours later and two more people are seeing the Cas 2 in the same place the that Isabel had seen it. So that made no sense. But again, these two men who saw the Cas 2, they just saw it and thought nothing of it because they don't know anything about this boat. It wasn't until later that they eventually came forward with what they saw. Then, one more day after that, on April 17th, the there were these fishermen that were out in their boats a little farther north of Champagne Bay, where Isabel and the two other men had seen the Cas 2 on consecutive days. And these fishermen, they spotted the Cas 2. And again, these fishermen do not know the Cas 2. They don't know its occupants. They're just seeing the ship. Except this time, the fishermen, when they saw the Cas 2, they thought something was wrong because they saw the Cas 2 from a distance navigating its way fairly close to shore in an area that these fishermen knew was full of coral reefs. It's a very dangerous area to be piloting any ship. In addition, the sail of the Cas 2 was totally ripped to shreds. And so the fishermen were looking at the ship wondering what they're doing, but the pilot of the ship looked so in control as he's navigating his way through the coral reefs that the fishermen thought, okay, he knows what he's doing, so, you know, leave him alone. But again, later on, they would report what they saw. It wasn't until the next day, April 18th, so three days after Des, Peter, and Jim had set sail, that anybody realized there was an issue with the crew of the Cas 2. 
Because on April 18th, oh, oh. a Coast Watch surveillance helicopter was flying over the Great Barrier Reef, and they looked down and they saw the Kaz 2 with its badly damaged sails, piloting all around this very dangerous part of the water to be piloting. And so the crew on board the helicopter attempted to radio down to the Kaz 2 to see if they were okay, but no one from the Kaz 2 called back to the helicopter. And so as they're waiting for a response from the CAS-2, the helicopter crew is watching the pilot of the CAS-2 clearly, you know, navigating the boat in between coral reefs. And it seemed like, you know, despite the damage to the sails, he knew what he was doing. And so to the crew on the helicopter, this didn't really look like an emergency, but it seemed like something worth flagging. And so they called the Marine police and said, hey, we have this ship here that's not responding. We think they're okay, but you might want to come take a look. And so the Marine police, they would come out to the area where the helicopter had said they had seen the CAS-2, and when they got there, the CAS-2 was gone. At this point, the Marine police got some information about the boat, CAS-2, and discovered who owned the boat and who was on this trip, so Des, Peter, and Jim, and the police would get in touch with all of their families, and they would all tell police that besides Peter's wife, who talked to Peter on that morning they left, no one had heard from any of the men. They had gone totally silent since that first day. And so when police heard this, they knew this had to be some kind of emergency, and so a search was launched to find the CAS-2. And 48 hours later, a rescue helicopter that was part of the search was about 80 or so miles off the northeastern coast of Australia when they looked down and they spotted the CAS-2. And it still had all torn up sails and it was kind of spinning listlessly in the water. And from the helicopter, they couldn't see anybody on board the ship. It was totally vacant on the deck. Now, at this point, authorities really have no idea what's going on with this boat or its occupants. It was possible that maybe they had been hijacked, and so Des, Peter, and Jim could be held hostage down below, along with the people that took them hostage. Or maybe the boat just got stolen, and Des, Peter, and Jim are not on this boat, and that it's just the criminals on board, and again, they're down below, hidden from view. You know, so authorities, they don't know. But they decided to take a risk and just send somebody down to get on that boat and just see what was going on. Oh, shit. Mm. Oh, that shit look good, too. I need some money. Yo, Darius, can I borrow a couple dollars? No, we all do. How much are you talking about, though? At least like 500. I got. So, a rescue wow, officer what? on board the rescue helicopter named Corey Benson was lowered by a rope where he was dropped into the water, and then Corey swam by himself over to the CAS 2 and he climbed up the side of the boat and he stepped onto the deck, and right away he noticed it was kind of like eerily quiet on board the boat. There was nobody he could see, and there was no sign of any disturbance, minus the sails of the ship being all tattered. And for a second, Corey thought about maybe calling out for Des, Peter, and Jim to see if they were down below and could come up and solve this mystery. But then he also worried that if he called out, there could be some bad people on board this boat, and he didn't want to draw their attention. And so Corey was quiet and just began walking towards the front of the boat. And as he did, he began to notice signs that people must have recently been on board this boat doing normal things. Like, for example, there was a fishing rod that was cast out into the water. Girl, what the hell is going on? It was anchored to a post on the side of the boat that looked like it had just been operated minutes ago. Oh, there was up. a blue mug of coffee that was just sitting on a table. What if what they go? Like maybe someone had been drinking from it recently. There was a neatly folded t-shirt on another chair with a set of glasses on them. I mean, there was just all these kind of tells that this was a boat that was being used recently. And when Corey actually got to the front of the boat where the captain would stand, he saw the engine was actually still on. It was idling. And so Corey turned it off. Now, at this point, Corey knew his next step was going down the stairs and opening up the door that led into the cabin down below to see if Des, Peter, and Jim were down there. But he also knew when he went down there, despite there being backup up in the helicopter and more people making their way out here, Corey would be all alone if there were criminals or bad people down there. Who fucked? But this was his job, and so after taking a deep breath, he turned and walked down the few steps, and he got to the door that led to the cabin. He grabbed the handle, and he opened it up. And the room he was walking into was kind of like a half-living room, half-kitchen area, and he saw there was this table, and on it was a newspaper that was dated April 15th. So the day the Kaz set sail. And then on the wall behind the newspaper was a calendar where days had been marked off all the way through April 14th. 
April 15th was not marked off. But also nearby on a table was a computer that was still plugged in and on and looked very much like someone had just been using it. And also there were plates of food that were out that didn't look that old that also seemed like people must have just been eating from them. And then also Cora could see past this common area into the bedroom and very obviously the bunks inside of there had been slept in. And so basically everything seemed like it was where it should go, be. What? There was just one problem. Dez, Peter, and Jim were not on this ship. There was no sign of where they were. They were just gone. And there was nobody else on board the ship. It was just completely abandoned with no sign of what happened. Dez, Jim, and Peter were never found. And so we have no idea what actually happened to them. Nor do we have any idea why they were seen by Isabel and the two men and the fishermen doing all these weird things like randomly piloting out towards open water, which totally... Somebody jet the plane and robbed their ass, tried to rob their ass or something. And killed their ass and threw their ass in the ocean separately. ...against their plan, which was stay close to shore, be safe. Or, you know, why on that second day they were seen in the same spot near Champagne Bay, indicating they had doubled back after going towards open water. You know, that went against their plan, which was point A to point B. Why are they doubling back around? And so, unfortunately, this whole thing is just one big mystery that has yet to be solved. God damn. Now that's crazy, I ain't gonna lie. And they still ain't been found. It's, it's making it more even crazy. Er, you feel me? That being said, give me a thumbs up, subscribe. See y'all motherfuckers on the next video. Hope y'all enjoyed this video. Let's ride, man. <laughs>